Hello and welcome to the fourth and final session of uh, PhD reviews that uh, we are hosting as part of the Digital Consortium. Um, this is a new uh, innovation. It allows uh, PhD candidates around the world, doctoral candidates around the world, to share their to share their their findings um, uh, and to get some feedback. Uh, we have four um, candidates here today. Um, each will be presenting for fifteen minutes, fifteen minutes each, and then they'll have fifteen minutes of feedback. Um, I'm be, I'm delighted uh, to be joined today by uh, Marisa Bell Marat, um, and uh, um, and Chow uh, Chow Yan will be um, will be hosting the event. So uh, over to you, Chow. Okay, thank you, Neil, for the introduction. Um, okay, so today is the last session, and we're going to follow the same format as the past two days. Um, so firstly, um, please allow me to introduce our first presenter, Chai Hua. Um, Chai Hua got his master's degree at Tongji University, and currently a PhD candidate here, supervised by Felix Feng Yuan. Uh, he is also in a joint PhD research program between Tongji and SAD. Um, uh, his research focuses on using digital design and robotic fabrication technology um, to improve and even revolutionize timber building construction. Uh, so please join me and welcome Chai Hua. Uh, sorry. Can you, can you see my screen now? Uh, not full screen yet. Wait. How about now? Uh, okay, great. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, this is Hua Chai from uh, Tongji University. And uh, uh, I am introduce myself first, and I'm now a PhD candidate here in Tongji University. I've started to work on robotic timber fabrication since uh, 2014, and from 2017, I start to start my uh, PhD research uh, under the direction of Professor Philip Yuan. And since when I have been involved in a lot uh, several workshops. It's exhibitions and practice uh, projects. And uh, most of them are in collaboration with uh, Fabiuni uh, or SED or Kiuni. So these experience have given me a lot of insight about the timber construction. And among them, my PhD research come from the understanding of the, uh, the co-evaluation of the tools, materials, and also the uh, design system in the field of uh, timber uh, construction. So when we look into the history of the timber buildings, uh, we, we can see uh, the history could be divided into different different phases according to the, to the tools that was used. And from hand tools, human machines to CNC and uh, uh, robots. And each of the, the, uh, those stages have has uh, its own tectonic potentials. Now in the timber construction industry today, uh, they take full use of the computer aided manufacturing technology and different uh, kind of uh, uh, specialized uh, timber machining center. It's developed to automate the, prefab the prefabrication process. Uh, the, pr the, the fabrication of the production of the existing timber uh, structure system like uh, the wood frame or the uh, multi-story uh, high-rise buildings. So in the process of the automation, automation the adaptability uh, to uh, the adaptability of the production system to different uh, kind of uh, design system is uh, getting lower and lower. But uh, in contrast, in the academia field, uh, Last decade have uh, witnessed the, the emergence of uh, a lot of uh, innovative timber uh, construction system. Uh, the academia takes robot as a new generation of tools, which can be uh, 
integrated into the design phase through the parametric control uh, uh, plugins of software, and which show higher uh, flexibility and uh, adaptability to different uh, construction situation and uh, uh, building system. So uh, now uh, when we try to ensure the possibility to uh, diffuse or merge the innovation in robotic fabrication into the timber construction industry. Uh, a new trend here is a robotic construction platform, which try to redefine the uh, construction industry by developing specialized uh, uh, robot, robot construction platform for different uh, uh, scenarios and the integrating uh, the achievement of the existing robotic fabrication technology. And common system are the gantry robots or the transportable uh, or mobile platforms. So uh, platform-based construction is not only a question of uh, automation, it's uh, also an opportunity to uh, explore the you know, uh, innovation in architectural design and also building system design. So in this context, my research focused on this uh, correlated two aspects. Uh, first, to develop different kind of uh, robotic fabrication platform that could uh, provide uh, innovation, uh, uh, intelligent solution for timber construction industry, and at the same time try to explore the uh, 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 related or uh, uh, related related building system of uh, timber buildings uh, with the. Uh, capacity of this uh, kind of new tools. So two paradigm of uh, uh, construction, the like offsite prefabrication and onsite construction is uh, uh, considered in my research as two scenarios for platform development. And uh, for this two scenario, two type of uh, platform, uh, the prefabrication platform and the mobile uh, on-site uh, fabrication platform is uh, developed. And the, the first, the prefabrication platform is a, a fixed gantry system with, with high uh, st stability and uh, targeting at mass customization of uh, complex timber structures. And the, the second is a mobile robot platform which could move freely on-site and uh, conduct uh, uh, the tasks like uh, aut automatic Lambo. So together with this, uh, this, this kind of uh, platform, two different uh, uh, application uh, are also considered and developed as example to show the interaction between this platform and the building system. So for the prefabrication scenario, the customization of double curved glue lamp structure is selected while, uh, while the mobile platform is uh, mainly focused on the multi-story construction system. So uh, I will, uh, so today I will introduce two projects that is uh, uh, developed based on this two, can, two platform. And uh, it's, I will start with the first one. So uh, and for the prefabrication, Prefabrication, uh, the platform is actually modified from the uh, gantry robotic uh, robotic system of uh, uh, Fabioni and Tongji University in Shanghai, and it uses three-axis uh, gantry system, to, uh, which is equipment equipped with uh, two hanging KUKA robot, and the gantry system have a, a twelve is twelve meters long. Uh, eight meters wide and the six meters high, uh, which provide uh, uh, sufficient sp uh, space for large scale prefabrication experiments and uh, also production. So to make it a timber construction platform, we uh, try to develop a, a, a set of uh, robotic effectors, uh, which is uh, designed for both additive uh, fabrication and the subtractive fabrication for timbers. And uh, it was developed at the two library, um, uh, including a uh, great pro with new gun, uh, universal milling module, uh, uh, a chainsaw module, and a benzo module. And uh, they are 
connected with the robot with a quick changer to uh, improve the efficiency of the tool changing. And each tool could be mounted on both robot arm. That also means that this uh, uh, the, the two robots could uh, use and control the same set of uh, tools. So with this uh, platform, we try to develop the new uh, uh, building system with a uh, double curved uh, glue lamp. This is a project uh, uh, for UABB 2019, and it's an, also an exhibition in Shenzhen. It there was a event to be non free curved wood beams interwined, interwined with each other, and all the elements are double curved glue lamps. So, so as we all know, there are all categories of uh, curvature in glue lamps the straight, the single curved, double curved with torsion and uh, double curves uh, uh, without torsion. And the first two uh, category, the straight and single curved, could be uh, produced directly in the uh, timber industry easily with uh, some mold of the press bite. Uh, but but uh, now there's still no efficient way to produce uh, those uh, double curved glue lamps. In this case, we try to introduce the, this uh, uh, robotic bandsaw cutting te technique, which could cut uh, this rude surface uh, with high efficiency and uh, accuracy. So, uh, with the plan, a, curve, uh, a single curved glue lamp with a uniform section that could be produced easily in the factory, and maybe uh, with a guide of a mold or CNC template. Uh, after that, the robotic bandsaw cutting could be easily merged into the existing uh, technology, the ex existing workflow to produce this double curved uh, beams by cut uh, 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 single curved beams, uh, cut root surface into the single curved one. So in this case, the capacity of this uh, uh, robotic bandsaw is uh, uh, an essential parameter that could uh, influence the design, the curvature of the final structure. So we make uh, uh, several experimental research that uh, test the ability of a saw blade uh, uh, to move along a series of arcs and uh, uh, with different radius and also to rotating along different root surface. So those uh, results could be result as a constraints in the computational design process to influence this uh, the coverage of the final structure. And in this project, each beam is uh, divided into eight segments to uh, with different lengths according to their global curvature, and there are uh, seventy-two double curved segments in total, and each of them uh, are expected to to be cut out. Uh, uh, from a single curved beams with a, a minimal minimum volume that could cover this double curved uh, target beams. So um, uh, the, the call of the robotic simulation and the, the programming process is uh, uh, use the uh, plugin called FU Robot, which is developed by Fabio Union, and also uh, this uh, the model of this. Uh, platform is uh, embedded into uh, this uh, plugin and also a programming toolkit for robotic timber fabrication called the tech wood is built inside by the robot. So uh, make use of this uh, two robots collab collaborative uh, construction. The two robots are responsible for bandsaw cutting and the joint mailing respectively. And one with its equipment with a spindle, and another one operated with a pencil factor. So, um, but the one difficulty here in in this process is to locate the material in space. So we, we set up a new uh, a set of infrared camera system, which could uh, give the platform to see the, and the ability to see where the material is and the uh, interface between this vision system and the grasshopper is developed. Uh, Real timely to, to transmit the information gathered by this vision system into Grasshopper in real time. And uh, after the fabrication, uh, this uh, 
72 segments will be reconnected with this uh, traditional uh, scalp joint on site to into non continuous beams. And uh, the final uh, structure actually is shows the ability of this uh, uh, prefabrication platform, the ability of the platform to uh, it handle the mass customization of this complex structure through the uh, multi tools and the multi robot uh, collaboration process. And this is the first project. And the second, we, we uh, try to use a, a multi, a, a mobile platform to uh, address the problem in the multi story uh, timber construction. Uh, this is actually the outcome of uh, collaboration between the University, ICD, and the Fab Unit. And uh, mm, uh, uh, as we know, the current paradigm in timber construction takes uh, uh, is uh, adopted from the manufacturing sectors, which stress uh, the advantage of uh, offsite uh, prefabrication. Uh, and the building system uh, need to be uh, uh, as the building element or the modules need to be trans transported to the um, to the building site. So uh, the scale of each module or each element is still limited by the transportation constraints. So instead of uh, this transportable building modules, we propose to fabricate directly on site with the transportable robotic platforms. The, uh, at on-site, uh, mobile construction could get rid of this uh, size constraints from the transportation. Uh, it could extend the traditional uh, unidirectional uh, spans to this multi-directional span, and also transform the standard grid in timber, the multi-story timber construction uh, to this uh, more adaptive networks. So. This is the uh, design of our proposed mobile uh, platform. It's, a, it's a composed of three parts. Uh, a track platform that moves the whole thing uh, freely on site, and one ABB robot is mounted on, on top of this platform. And also a customized tool station for timber processing is developed, which uh, uh, the robot, a, a nail gun with uh, uh, a grip with nail gun is mounted uh, onto the robot. It could grip uh, elements and uh, when like uh, uh, goes grip a beam and when through a glue station to apply glue and then put, uh, assemble the element and then nail it in space. So it could perform this kind of additive assemble of timber structure with the materials that is uh, uh, available. Um, so, as this platform could used to in incrementally glue timber element into this uh, uh, geometrically complex or uh, uh, unconstrained timber slab structure. So, two scenarios is, con is considered. One is to first uh, erect the column and the, uh, and the slabs and then the uh, robot will reinforce the, the slab uh, beneath, uh, from beneath. And uh, uh, another one is to, to uh, pre, uh, prefabricate this uh, slab on site, near site, and then up, uh, lift it in place after the completion of the reinforcement. The generation of this design system and tectonics directly take use of the result from the structural optimization under certain boundary conditions and also different beam arrangement with the linear timber element was uh, designed and explored. The, this arrangement uh, allow the branching and the converging stream of beams uh, within a multi-directional support network. And the tectonic system of the beam was then generated uh, through the neg negotiate of different constraints and boundary conditions uh, with an agent-based modeling algorithm. And the beams will be, then be, uh, could be uh, divided into clusters and the robots will fabricate from one foundation to another. Once it, uh, the robot moved, it could relocate itself by identify 
uh, the pre-embedded markers. It can also scan the beams that ha have already been built to uh, uh, adaptively update the next the, strat the strategy for next step. So this is also the proposal we uh, did in last uh, summer uh, for Digital Future Workshop. So uh, this is a design that developed by the participants. And uh, we finally demo this. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Chao, one minute. Okay, uh, uh, in Shanghai and uh, uh, by Fabiuni and Tongjing University, and we test the sequence of the fabrication routine. And we also make a, a, a concept, this concept, uh, uh, make a de dem uh, demonstrator with uh, this concept uh, at the one column thing. And now we are trying to build a large scale pavilion with this uh, kind of system, which is, is expected to be finished uh, in next month, I think. And th this year we also have a workshop in this year to take the future, which try to um, further explore the potential of this mobile construction platform. And I think this is my the, the end of my presentation. Thank and I'm ready to hear some comments. Okay, thank you, Chai Hua. Uh, I think it's really wonderful presentation. And now I will invite Neil, Marcel Bell, and Philip uh, to give some comments and also put forward some questions. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. I could I could start. I, I mean, thank you. That was uh, it's obviously I know this well reasonably well. Not the last part so much, but some of the previous part. I think what I find interesting about um, about your uh, your research is the kind of the collaboration with ICD. I mean, we've always, I, I have two of my former students, um, Dylan Wood and Tiffany Cheng, who were there. Uh, and, and of course, we have a Akim giving lectures for us on, on the, in, uh, for the Tongji PhD program. But it's a different, that's one thing. But to actually be in a collaboration with them, I just wanted to find out really what, what did that mean? Did you get to go to Stuttgart? Um, did you, uh, what, would, what, did you what, was the, what was the nature of the collaboration? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, last year, uh, uh, when uh, in 2020, I have been in Stuttgart in ICD for one year to collaborate with uh, uh, Hans uh, Wagner Jakob. Yeah, 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 sorry, Hans Jakob Wagner to uh, work on this uh, uh, this system, and uh, we collaborated re remotely with uh, researchers here in Shanghai uh, in February to. Uh, developed this system, and we also try to test the system. system hey, hey. Okay. So, what what were the differences you noticed? I mean, because the I think one thing about ICD is that actually the students take many many years to complete their their doctorate. But what did what did you what did you experience? What did you Personally, uh, the differences you notice between the China, the German approach and the and the Chinese approach. Uh, I, I think this uh, uh, collaboration is uh, a, a long term collaboration between Tongji University and the uh, uh, ICD. And when I'm there, I'm actually most of them I'm uh, work with the researchers there to. Uh, Maybe uh, talk about the system design, and uh, as at the same time we will try to uh, collaboratively uh, uh, like update the system of the uh, the design of the platform. So uh, what uh, impressed me is, uh, a lot is about the how the the, the very. It's more thinking about the, how the uh, system of the, the platform design and the building system design is uh, uh, going like in uh, 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 in in the same direction. They like a co uh, development in, in a, a evolution way. So uh, sometimes in China when we do. Uh, do some project we use the uh, uh, the existing setup of tools of of uh, uh, equipment uh, to think how we could uh, uh, 
fabricate something or design something uh, with the tools we had. But now uh, what uh, the, the things change to be that uh, we uh, need to both design the platform, the tools, and also to uh, innovate the building system in in uh, like a uh, uh, related uh, uh, manner. Th thank you, thank you. Ms. Bell? Yes, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation. I had a few questions and, and then um, some comments. One of uh, the questions I had um, have to do with this um, notion of um, uh, adding and then subtracting. So there's this, uh, this modulation that you're uh, engaging in, which is almost like you're building up and then throwing away part of what you build up. Had, had you um, worked through this um, in any other way to try to get these double curvatures or that was just sort of kind of the, the method that could best be implemented uh, with the tools that you had? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I think I, I, I didn't get to... Well, let me continue. Then, then another, uh, so one question I had was the, the method was that you, the approach with this tool, with this uh, method of construction, had to do with building up your glue lamb timbers that then you were then carving to get your double curvatures. Was that the only way that, uh, that you could uh, find to do this with that particular tool? Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, we, uh, before we have this robotic pencil uh, technique, we know in the industry, they always use the mailing tools to uh, get this uh, complex uh, forms. And, uh, but uh, it also uh, means it's a uh, immense cost of materials and also times to it will uh, produce a lot of dust and uh, waste in, in the process. So the, the advantage of this cutting process is uh, it have the lowest uh, curve in in the saw cutting in all the saw cutting and the, 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 it will produce uh, like a vol uh, uh, produce this uh, curved. Uh, the root surface in only one cut and the produce uh, the waste will be also some uh, uh, volume yeah. things yeah. so so then the other question that i have th thank you and then the other question that i had had to do with um one of my favorite uh, parts the slides that you had which is where you have all the different sort of uh variations on this double curvature that you can achieve uh uh the segments of your of your curves um, I believe it was uh, it, it was a, a lot of elements kind of stacked, uh, or not stacked, but laid out. And my question for you on that was, uh, I could see the infinite possibilities for geometries. And I was a little bit struck at the very end of your presentation um, that in the end, spatially, we end up with a slab and a column. And so in some ways, you know, we revert back to in uh, sort of the, the, the um, uh, the, the maison dominant as a, as a structural paradigm. And I was wondering if uh, there was, a, so that slide number 25 is the one I was talking about. And I'm wondering whether uh, you had explored other geometries and other configurations for how to sort of use these elements to, to shape space from a design point of view. So I don't know if the slab and column just uh, sort of strengthening the slab was part of the premise at the outset of your experiment? And I guess that's my question. Or had you explored other spatial developments? Yeah, I, I think this uh, slab and column thing is a, a very first step of our uh, research on this onsite uh, uh, mobile construction. And uh, the idea is uh, about to uh, fabricate this uh, continuous beams onsite to produce uh, this unlimited uh, uh, unlimited uh, beam system directly. And this also could be a very efficient way to uh, build this kind of uh, um, uh, yeah. column slabs uh, system. But uh, also uh, uh, our, our next step is trying uh, to go further to uh, make uh, things like to make it more 3D 
dimensional mm -hmm. things and try to fabricate them uh, more uh, complex or what we call this special glue line structure directly with uh, uh, this uh, robot. Uh, and uh, this is uh, maybe what, what we are going to explore in the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Neil and Marcel. Hope Philip is here. Would like to have some final remarks about Philip? Probably uh, I give some quick feedback. Uh, we're in the school, uh, in the studio right now. Uh, probably, Shafa, um, you should turn off your video. Yes. Uh, Okay, so uh, I'm in the studio, so it's sorry for uh, not participate, participate the whole process, but to briefly um, showing Shanghai is presenting what we're doing in Shanghai. Actually, it's a quiet integration and not matters the platform of communication, but the platform of fabrication. So we, we set up Fabioni as a platform uh, to integrate industry um, nationally uh, here in China, in Shanghai. I think it's meaningfully not just in the studio or in the workshop, but uh, goes directly to the real project. We already finished uh, dozens of projects in the past five years and implement uh, the robotic um, uh, instruments and platforms in situ off, um, situ, uh, off site uh, platform uh, in the real project. So um, uh, the um, machine learning and also uh, including the robotic um, uh, 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 technology have a lot of um, uh, uh, engagement uh, um, truly uh, into the reality. So. Um, uh, I think Tsai Hua is in his fourth year of uh, the PhD study. And uh, in the next year, uh, we're look for, looking forward, he should uh, finish his thesis uh, uh, in a short time. And um, right now he's wrapping up um, the, uh, the paper and uh, uh, publish uh, several papers in automation um, in const construction. I think uh, that is a, uh, uh, the presentation showing how we educate a PhD here in Shanghai, and why uh, I think we want to share to the to the world, and probably have more um, collaboration because, we, for example, we uh, collaborate with ICD, and some of the instruments actually here is much better than Germany, and uh, that is a huge leap forward progress we're doing. Actually, Fabian and right now have ten thousand square meters. Um, uh, labs uh, or factories in downtown Shanghai, which is under construction. And um, um, uh, the robotics is uh, engaged uh, closely to the architects, which is um, not just a paradigm shift um, in theory, but uh, as a paradigm shift in industry, in reality. So that's my few comments to Xiaohua's presentation. Okay, thank you, Philip, and also thank, thank you again, Chai Hua, for the presentation. Um, now we have to move to the second presenter, um, Alicia Nahamed. Um, okay, so firstly, let me let me introduce her. Um, Alicia, uh, Alicia holds a PhD in human-robot collaboration from Cardiff University and a Master of Architecture from the AADRL. And she is the founder of Architecture Extrapolated, and assistant professor at the University of, of Calgary. Um, she's also the co-director of the laboratory for integrative design. Um, for the past five years, Alicia worked as a student master at AADRL and also as a research-based practicing architect. Uh, she explores uh, materials and digital fabrication technology uh, along with the digitization of building trades and the wisdom of traditional building cultures. Uh, also, she also involved in the award-winning um, project Need Cadella. Um, so let's welcome uh, Alicia. Please take the stage. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, share. Oops. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much um, for the invitation and for being here. 
So today um, I'm kind of going to be talking about uh, the doctoral dissertation, which oh, it's not working, uh, which I kind of um, call like how, how designer George Robot. So that's not the, the, the title. The title was like kind of studying uh, kind of uh, the, the human factors that influence human robot collaborative design processes. And uh, this was a, a kind of a dissertation at Cardiff University uh, sponsored by the EPSR team uh, with uh, Dr. Awas Njabi. Uh, so basically, I just want to show like a little bit of the structure of the dissertation as a kind of high level overview of what happened. So it is divided in two parts. So basically, the first part is more like a kind of an introduction on the theoretical resources, which are based on like actor network theory and a mixed research methods, a literature review. And then on the second part, it kind of uh, presents a development of like a theoretical framework of what are the key the, the factors that kind of can influence and how do we relate to robots and what and how is that influence on a human and robot relations. There are a few research studies that were conducted uh, with like different participants or from around the world. And, and, and then uh, the results were analyzed kind of quantitatively and qualitatively before uh, reporting findings. There was also like a part where we kind of integrated machine learning on the, on the uh, collaborative process to kind of start to make robots a bit more intelligent and see what will happen. Uh, so to start with like that, this dissertation looks at how kind of designers uh, judge robots and how do we feel about working with robots. And this is something that I felt uh, was a gap in the work that I, that I was doing at the time and have been doing for a long time. And kind of as robots uh, kind of become ever more present in like kind of uh, research laboratories, architectural schools, and, uh, and they become like these orange friends as, uh, as Carl Bass kind of once called them. Uh, I think that they are uh, still like a, the, the domain of very specialized knowledge. And, and when we are talking about uh, in this platform about inclusive futures, they are not really kind of uh, the kind of tool that everyone is using in the same way as like kind of a, a 3D printer or other machines. They remain very much there some uh, postgraduate program for some students that have a very specialized interest on kind of uh, on using uh, robotics. And the idea and the question was like, well, how can we democratize robotics? And maybe there is something that we can uh, used to make the interactions better and to help them be everywhere. And this is kind of like um, humans and machines. So like we kind of see that when we um, study kind of uh, machines and when we study humans or designers, there are many disciplines that kind of focus on the different uh, ways of, of very complex beings, which, which is like kind of humans or designers. We can analyze like kind of psychological, uh, from a psychology perspective, economics, how do we relate? How do we kind of uh, have competition, how would they get power from a political science, from anthropology in like sense of like historical uh, records of humans, how do we behave, how do kind of uh, information affects our behavior. When we go to like robots and how robots communicate, it does become a lot of like a less amount of things. We have protocols and networks and uh, ways of communication between robots. Uh, we as designers, we can also program robots. We know about IK solvers. We also have all the digital tools and software. We can also build robots, and we have the tools to, to, to build all kind of different robotics um, uh, to work with. And more like recently, we are also kind of starting to get worried about kind of how do machines also look at us? How do, we, how do they um, kind of think about us? And that comes on uh, like through machine learning, where we kind of uh, start to talk about uh, machine ethics, like in the case of like self-driving cars or these other kind of machines or machine biases when we talk about data collection biases or algorithmic fairness. But the question here is like, how do we judge the robots? How do we feel about interacting with them and not only what we can do with them? And, uh, and when we're talking about robotics for design rather than for like fabrication, there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, one is that when we kind of look at the literature of previous research work on human robot collaboration, most of it is based on robots that are meant for collaboration, like all kind of uh, humanoid robots or like collaborative robots, not on like kind of industrial robot arms, which are the robots that we kind of are mostly using because of their accuracy, precision for all of their fantastic characteristics. The other thing is that even in the industry, when we when they do have collaborative robots that are not behind the cage, and when we look at the case study of human robot collaboration with industrial robots, they are very much task operated. They are not like for any kind of creative or any intellectual kind of a stimulating task, but the human and the robot are only kind of doing a preconceived, predefined task with very specific goals and very uh, specific plan. Uh, when we kind of look at design tasks, we do require from a different approach. We, we need kind of metrics that are not so much uh, based on like efficiency and, and, and getting a task done, but are more about opportunities for discovery, about how can we like use the robots to give us some feedback, to give us more in, uh, information and to help us to explore this like indeterminate space 
um, of, of design where we can find surprising results, where we can kind of find things and give them this agency that can allow us to, to, um, to, to, to help us into finding something that we don't know exactly what it is, but it's like a soft goal. So that kind of really starts to become very relevant. Um, the other thing, and it's also something important to consider is that we as designers, or architects, we work a lot with like end effectors, we kind of change them, we hack them, we make our own end effectors. Uh, when we evaluate a human robot collaboration and, and humans judge robots, we tend to judge them as a whole. So like even if the end effector is something that we had that we is not like industrially made, but it fails, then it is look as if the robot failed. It's not exactly look as well, like the robot is actually good, it's only that what I put on, on its end is, is not so good. So that's not how, how it kind of comes across. So, so the idea was how can we um, when, like how can we like start to kind of have a set of metrics that allow us to understand this panorama uh, with the implications for the design activity when we kind of work uh, with robots, which are not the same as, as in a kind of industrial robotic collaborations. Um, and so like for, um, and, and we kind of uh, also kind of think that design is about finding like these right questions rather than actually solve very specific problems that are very targeted and then we can know what is the correct answer when is wrong and when is bad. How can we use robotics, uh, not in a single repetitive way, but actually like I think uh, inquiry and like this flexibility. So this was kind of some of the things that we consider when we were doing the, uh, the literature review and trying to understand what are the metrics that we should put out there to kind of uh, evaluate these interactions and actually help the robots to become more um, acceptable, uh, especially with non-expert designers. What I call non-expert designers is like kind of a, a students or researchers that are not specifically are architects and designers, not specifically uh, learning in a robotics course or interested in robotics. So we came with, a, with this kind of panorama of like what we call like the influencia as defined as like the ease of collaboration between the designer and the robot. And there are like kind of different subtopics. I will not go into detail in all of the subtopics, but there are four main subtopics, which is like the trust, uh, the robustness and the improvement and collegiality. And then each subtopic is divided in four different subtopics. So we kind of analyze all of these. So the main ones being like um, kind of robustness, which is like the like a functional team is not dysfunctional. The improvement in this case, it's only the human is improving, but still it was evaluated. And uh, the collegiality of the relationship uh, between both colleagues being one being the robot, one being the human and the trust that the human has in the robot. Uh, as you can see, each of them is kind of further divided, like trust has like the robotic elements, the human elements, the task elements. And the robot are like performance, the feedback that it is giving to the design, the physical attributes, how does that influence how designers perceive them, digital attributes referring to the programming of the robot, uh, which is also something that normally people don't do when they work with robots, they don't program the robot, they only do the task. Also the human elements, uh, experience, performance, safety, other elements like the task complexity. So all of these sub elements were evaluated. Uh, robustness and like the identity attribution of blame credit, which is kind of proven that humans are more like lenient with other humans than with machines. So how do we kind of share responsibility, credit and blame on the different results and collegiality at uh, the partnership? How do we relate to them? So we also devised a task that could enable this collaboration. Initially, we kind of work with uh, subtractive and additive uh, uh, tasks. The problem is that once things are done, there was not really a lot of opportunities for the feedback loop. So then we kind of uh, had three main characteristics. One was that it had to have a design component. So people had to design what they are going to do to keep this ownership and to kind of control over the task. Also, it had to be, um, we decided for an incremental forming process, which allows to kind of have continuous feedback because the form is not defined until it is defined. So there was like a, a period of interaction where the feedback was very valuable to know what is happening. And there was the feedback loop, which meaning the robot was continuously scanning and giving back information um, to the designer for the designer to add. So basically the designer will propose something and then it started forming it. And, and through the scanning process, the robot will be kind of, uh, kind of giving new tool paths to keep going towards that goal of the initial form found um, object. Uh, in the second part, we introduce a uh, unit network. So we kind of capture simulations of how we, we capture like point clouds of how the material was deforming with train a neural net. And then uh, in this case, now the robot also kind of has more information than the designer because it will know what, how the material will react if you plunge it in any given position, just because now it has been trained for that. So we are kind of starting to see a position where actually the, the robot will have more information. And then we kind of uh, had these questionnaires where we kind of were evaluating everything, like asking like, uh, do you feel very comfortable, non-comfortable? So it was a Likert um, scale questionnaire, one to five with like kind of uh, from very reliable to not reliable, et cetera, depending on the question that was being asked uh, for the design task. 
uh, as an ANT based um, kind of methodology. So it was all based on like Latour when um, Calon and Latour who define like any element uh, which vents a space around itself and makes other elements dependent on itself and translate their language into a language of its own. So the more important thing is that everything was about relations. So we kind of have a uh, had all the data, data is the most kind of valuable thing in this case. So we have interviews, transcripts, field notes, and really kind of try to focus on this idea of following the, the actants and kind of uh, through them start to establish networks of relations and understand how, how, how things, uh, how, how the research is starting to come together. So, so all of this was kind of transcribed and was evaluated uh, kind of uh, through like a qualitative analysis software like um, Atlas TI to kind of really try to establish this network of relations and see what actants are affecting which others and how relations are starting to be formed. Um, we also used like quantitative uh, research methods, which was like uh, SPSS, which is like kind of a statistical analysis for the, for the questionnaires to kind of understand which of all of our questions kind of are having more impact into the results, which ones are actually we can we can uh, we cannot use, which ones are less relevant. So and, and then the data was cross-referenced, especially because in a lot of the cases when like kind of um, maybe participants will say like they really trust the robot, but then they are acting in a way where they are kind of very shy or not really comfortable, then we could actually cross-reference this and then start to see, well, yes, but and, and you, what you are saying is something, but your actions are different. And we could kind of have a way of leveraging actually what is the feelings and how people is reacting also uh, when they are in more proximity, when they are not uh, close to them. And then we kind of have this like, uh, start to have these maps of relations that maybe uh, I'm not going to like uh, are for each of the different um, each of the different aspects of the of the design task or each of the different kind of aspects that we evaluated. So like then the magenta is like kind of negative stuff. The purple is like more positive stuff. So for some things, for example, emotional response to the robots it was like kind of very positive, very exciting. Cross robot motion was not so good. Was actually something that participants were feeling very uncomfortable with, and you can see, like, I mean, for for all of the different kind of uh, physical attributes and kind of interactions, we kind of had like a similar a similar um, status where we kind of were looking at how, how people are feeling, and we quantified all of these and, and cross reference all of these between like the the interview and the rationale of dividing all the concepts was the idea that interaction is very individual and it will not be able to be to be uh, evaluated from what I see or, or from what is in the videos, but it has to be like this kind of fully co-reference uh, set of like uh, variables. Uh, like for example, feedback, which was something very important for us, generally very well taken, uh, like kind of some of the most exciting things for most of the participants, especially like to be able to know that the robot is reliable. But then also that was kind of cross-reference with the idea of like people uh, could have the opportunity to scan as many times as they can. There wasn't a limit. Some people did only one scan. Some people actually dismissed the full scan and said like, well, I only want to take control. I want to take the dish pendant. I want to jog the robot. I don't care whatsoever. Even if they know that the robot actually knows a lot more and has a lot of more information than what they have. Whereas other people actually became very engaged and did like more than five, six, seven scans and were really kind of allowing the robot to do its own path and to follow and ended up being very satisfied on like, oh, well, actually I could do what I wanted to do through, through this kind of collaboration. So there was like kind of aspects that were evaluated, not only through what was said, a lot of this was evaluated through like, uh, like these specific aspects that are on TL are evaluated through what was seen and through the field notes and through like all of the different aspects. And, um, Based on that, we kind of like uh, as a, we, we kind of uh, put together like a set of recommendations of how can we actually start to adapt this this robot this this uh, the, the machines and how can we like start to create these like tools to to allow for ease of integration and and for like more designers to adopt them from like very early stages not so much for fabricate for like but for like actually kind of explore. And for me, something very interesting is like the kind of the whole like um, human robot kind of collaboration is like a very kind of complex and um, fascinating kind of area that do, does leads to a lot of like kind of a philosophical and, and ethical questions. Like for example, when, when the humans were in control and they could decide whether the robot should proceed with the task, uh, or, whereas it, or they could decide they want to do whatever they want. But then sometimes like the robot will know a lot more. So shall we actually make a smarter robots that will tell to the human, no, you shouldn't do that. That's actually all wrong. I'm going to do, I'm going to do what I want. So, so who should have actually more power on these decisions? And how can we actually start to consider this? Is, is, is it okay? Uh, or, or should it be like uh, always like a subservient kind of, a, of machine who has the last decision? And I think that this is kind of something that we really, especially when we add mach uh, machine learning to the robot and when it's actually knowing really like all, having a lot of more data, we can really 
thing like, are we offering machines that can work together and they have more initiative and they can work in different ways to accomplish this kind of like um, higher level goals um, with their human partner. And however, um, in, even in these cases, uh, can it be, it could be like a counterproductive kind of result, or it can be like a fantastic synergy. It will only depend on the human kind of having this very clear and accurate understanding of the robot. And the important thing is how do we facilitate this understanding to make very transparent and legible what the robots are going to do to allow humans to be, to judge them in a way that actually uh, is, um, is beneficial for the whole process rather than feeling that they have to overpower them or have to kind of do, um, to have the control. And as designers, I think that the aspect of control, losing control is something that really kind of keeps coming across and keeps coming like, uh, no, I, I, even if he has more information, I, I still want to do what I want to do. So that kind of is, is kind of a line on, on defining this, this um, these uh, trust and, and this element that can allow us to enable like kind of a, a better collaboration. Uh, yes, thank you. So, so that's uh, kind of what I wanted to end up with were like some of these uh, kind of more uh, philosophical questions that I think are very kind of valuable and important um, for me. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for, for the wonderful presentation. And now let's invite Neil and Marisa Bell. Yeah, maybe I, I could start. I mean, uh, thank you. It's a great presentation. Um, but, <laughs> but I mean, and I don't want to say anything because, because I mean, you, you, when you work with someone, you, 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 collaboration with your supervisor, you've put your trust in, and, 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 and that's the collaboration, you know, you don't want anyone else getting in the way, but I just wanted it maybe to, to, you to know that there, there have been some discussions. I mean, philosophical discussions actually, uh, about, um, uh, especially, actually, in fact, just a few days ago, um, about Bruno Latour and actor network theory. Um, uh, Mambo Zalanda and I had a, a long discussion about this. I mean, I have to say that from my point of view, I am hugely suspicious of uh, uh, of Latour and, and the actor. And so is so is so is um, Mambo Zalanda. So you might like to have a look and see what they said about it. I mean, I I I really think there's a danger in anthropomorphizing uh, the, the the robots. And and my work is the opposite to say that we have to be careful. To understand that when we use terms like uh, learning in machine learning or, or intelligence in AI, it's not the same as, and, and it's so easy for us to project onto the machine human emotions and things. Um, anyway, that's that'll be my point. But I had a, an interesting discussion with Madeline Gannon about this at uh, Acadia about three years ago or something like that. And she's kind of like, you know, she talks about how you it becomes a, she presents herself as a robot whisperer and so on. I, I, I mean, and then I challenged her on that, and she did feel a little nervous. So um, uh, to my mind, the, the term that, that's much more uh, useful, but it's just me, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, is, 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 is the notion of affordance that comes from Gibson. I, I think to ascribe agency to, to robots is a, is, 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 is a it, I'm very nervous about that. And so, it, oh, but Delanda articulates in a beautiful way. So he makes some, some distinctions. The only other thing I'd say, so, I mean, it's my view, so just, just ignore it, okay? But the other thing is, um, I'm also I got a colleague who kind of goes on about quantitative analysis and, and questionnaires. I'm 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 incredibly suspicious of that. It's, it seems to be an old fashioned way of operating. I wonder what is you know, as a challenge, what might be a, a kind of more contemporary way of uh, of analyzing data? Because as soon as you ask people questions, they present a very subjective viewpoint. Right. And, and you know, how might you begin to analyze things in a different way. I mean, I, I remember when I was a student, people would come around with clipboards, you know, in the supermarkets and things and, and, and shopping malls, and they would kind of ask you questions. And they don't do that anymore, because they know already, you know, from from other forms of feedback of what people's tastes are. And I just would, I would throw that challenge out there, you know, well, isn't quantitative analysis, isn't, isn't this kind of questionnaire thing a little bit kind of, but I'm just saying this is a provocation, because I think it's really important to kind of, uh, to, I don't expect you to buy into what I'm saying, but I, I think I just want to say that there are other ways of, of approaching it, and, and there were some deeply philosophical issues at the basis of what you on, the, uh, on what, about you, what you're talking about. And I would just say, have a look at the discussion with uh, Mamel Delander in the Architecture of Philosophy session a, a, a few days ago, because that might be that might be entertaining for you. Um, yeah. But it was absolutely. a great presentation. Thank you, Alicia. It's fantastic. I think that, uh, and absolutely, Neil. And I think that the idea of like the questionnaires, yeah, I mean, it was like an idea of starting to have some 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 parameters, but of course, it's not something that we can rely. And we kind of had to cross-reference everything with like kind of more like 
video-based information or like kind of uh, how do people react. So like definitely I, I fully agree on that, on, on that part. But I think that it was important to kind of to start to look at some, uh, what is important? What, what can we evaluate otherwise? Or how can we make things that are not, that they start to become ten, tangent on like how, how things are working, how people are reacting to certain things. Like for example, we got people like kind of really kind of, uh, not, not, not on the questionnaires, but kind of talking about the, the thing that I'm more comfortable about is it doesn't kind of come out of the ground. And, and things that are very unexpected, right? It's just like, it's just like I think based on ideas and, and preconceptions. So definitely we're not trying to make the robots be anthropomorphic, but it's the idea that when they know information because they can process all the data being computers, basically, they do know more. Do you think they think? No, I, I mean, they don't think, but they know because they have a computer in their brain, right? So they can, so we kind of give them, for example, we have all the information of how the material will react based on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, databases that we created and we trained. So it will actually know what will happen. Whereas maybe for some, a lot of the people, it was a surprise because like, it's, um, it's like you, you, you deform something, it bounces back. There are behaviors on the material that are not linear and they cannot predict, and you cannot really predict if you don't, if you haven't worked with it for a long time, you need to get that tacit information through years of experience of, of working with certain materials to kind of be able to say, well, I know what will happen, right? If you're a newbie, you don't know, but the robot can have that information because you feed it with that information. Okay, no, but I just have a, Delanda's from, from Mexico too, right? So you, you'd find it entertaining, <laughs> shall we say. I love Delanda, I think he's-, I, he's yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Alicia, I just wanted to say thank you as well. I enjoyed your presentation and one of the things, though, I wanted to again, it's it sort of provokes a lot of thought, which is a, a, as well uh, what we want from a dissertation, obviously. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting was the fact that it was very unclear to me, and it may be to me only, but that you were sliding between this idea of collaboration, uh, uh, collaboration between sort of the human and this uh, robot, uh, the extension of the designer, and then also sliding into some sort of new synergy, synthetic, uh, some sort of uh, different sort of type, kind of productive organism. And one of the things I think is really interesting that sort of kind of set up a red flag in my, in my brain was this idea that uh, uh, when you first said, well, we want to keep control. So one of some of the premises that we have, we want to keep control, but we want to maintain continuous speculation. And then, uh, but, you know, when, you know, but, but we can't let things stop because because uh, then uh, the feedback loop, you know, can't be, can't be uh, continued to generate. And one of the things I was wondering while you were saying this, you were listing these as sort of kind of some of your uh, parts of your paradigm was, oh, so who determines when it stops? When do you uh, understand, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when do you understand that you've arrived at a conclusion from a design point of view? Yeah, I think that, that that's the question, right? Like right now, like we see that kind of, uh, because right now we kind of have this paradigm where like kind of humans, they have the final word, right? So the robot is proposing stuff or like it's kind of telling them and then they can decide, well, no, or yes, I do it or I don't do it. And, and then they can take the decision. And that's what I'm kind of um, like, like think, or I'm kind of, uh, as, as the future is like, shall, shall this keep being the case? Or shall, and, and, or shall it be the case where like the robot could actually kind of take control and, and just like over, over and like just and, and we can start to see cases where like if, if it has like for example like robots that have more information they will just not do something that hurt that, that, that will destroy them they will not do auto destruction right so so will it kind of uh will it be able to stop and to say no that won't work and uh, and, and and just do a different thing so that's something that i don't know i think that's that's an interesting uh, question and definitely a super interesting question that i'm very curious to to understand. Right now, it does seem that the question of keeping control for like, at least from, from a lot of the participants, it really came up around that, that although they could see what was the result, they could keep seeing it and they could see what is what is going to happen. Um, they, they will still say, no, I just want to jog it. I, I, I just want to do what I want because I just want to do it. And, and I think that that's something that that is like, uh, I know that there is a lot of theory about like uh, we as designers, we like to be in control and all of this. There has been a lot of theorization about that kind of feelings of, of us. And um, it's something that I, that I find kind of interesting. Yes, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer. Well, I think it's also interesting because uh, as you were speaking just now, I was just thinking about, you know, the, it's, it's a hard thing as well, and not to take up too much time here, 
um, the idea of designing in a team as well. So, you know, you're, you're talking about essentially, it's a very basic problem. It's a problem between an individual designing and then all of a sudden there's a design team and you're one of several in a design team. And so that's a very different dynamic. And um, so it's not just about human robot, the, the, it, it's something else about the process of design and design thinking that I think is uh, part of this, uh, part of this investigation. So thank absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah, no, that, that's absolutely spot on. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maricel, and thank you, Neil, and thank you, Alicia, for the, for the presentation. Uh, so now let's move to our third presenter, uh, Gabriel Mira. Um, so Gabriel is a, is a computational design specialist and a data scientist uh, with cross-functional expertise in acoustic design, structural design, robotics, and machine learning. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, he, he researched acoustic design and optimization, which led to three built shells. Uh, he also delivered workshops on this topic in Italy and China. Uh, since 2017, he has been working as a res uh, research assistant on several research projects at RMIT and the University of Melbourne. Uh, now he is currently doing a PhD in artificial intelligence in design at the University of Melbourne and also teaches computational design and acoustics there. Uh, welcome, um, Gabriel, please take the stage. All right, just one second. All right, thank you for the introduction, Chao. So in this presentation, um, I will show you a uh, few results of my PhD, which is um, supervised by Dr. Alberto Pugnale at the University of Melbourne and by Associate Professor Wally Smith. The title of my presentation is Expertise, Playfulness, Playfulness and Analogical Reasoning three strategies to train artificial intelligence in architecture and structural design. So before showing the results of my presentation, I would like to start with a quote by Fray Otto. So Fray Otto said that uh, computers could be considered as cows. You feed them good grass and you get good milk, which means that you feed computers good instructions and then you can get a good output. So I have a provocation here. So can we consider computer-aided design more like cow-eyed design? So the fact is, since the computer-aided design was introduced in 1963 with the sketchpad, uh, we still use the computer the same way. We provide the computer instruction. We need to transform our design idea in computational terms and then apply um, the computer to solve a specific problem. And this hasn't changed much even today. So on the right, you see generative design, which was produced proposed by Autodesk in 2017 as a strategy that could have revolutionized design, but this actually didn't happen. So the reason for this is that uh, computational tools are mainly used to solve problems. So in order to solve a problem designer need to uh, first develop a design idea and then formulate it, formulate it in computational terms. So we can use computers for problem solving and apply strategies like optimization in order to um, model a design mechanism, which involves the generation of a large variety of solutions and their evaluation in order to maximize some performance requirement. But uh, problem framing, which is the process by which designers develop ID and then formulate um, those ideas in computational terms, is something that the designer does on its own. It relies on its knowledge and experience. So what I'm doing in my PhD is trying to understand if AI can play a more active role in uh, comp computational design tools in order to support this process of problem framing. So what I claim is that in order to do so, we need different computational design models and specifically models that are able to model some aspects of the design cognition. So here you see um, a representation of a different form of interaction between the human and uh, uh, the machine. We still have an exchange of information, um, but we have uh, a different, uh, we, we see the, uh, the appearance of uh, something new in here. So we see this artificial neural network and write that is not pre-programmed to do something. So it doesn't receive instruction in a conventional way, but is trained to learn from an structural knowledge base. So this is my first, um, the first question that I'm trying to answer my uh, PhD. How can we train artificial neural networks in design? And the, the second one is which new forms of human machine interaction um, artificial neural networks can bring in uh, conventional computer aided design systems. 
So to answer the first questions, I am analyzing three different um, learning mechanisms. So um, I consider expertise and playfulness, playfulness and analogy or reasoning as three strategies that humans use in order to learn about design. The first one, is most straightforward. So designers learn by using knowledge about design precedents and then reuse such knowledge for the development you design idea. Playfulness involves interacting with objects with no boundaries. So designers also learn by trial and error with such an activi activities uh, as um, model making, for example. The third one is analogical reasoning, which involves uh, gathering knowledge and information from a different domain, which is not necessarily related to design. And an example is like the use of nature as a source of inspiration for the development of design idea. So I will start with expertise and show you a few applications that I developed um, to model this learning mechanism. So the first one um, concerns the um, training an AI model on an artificial data set that was constructed for the design of structures. So you, here you see, uh, the, the variables that were used to generate a set of design solutions. And these design solutions represent um, funicular shapes that were obtained by a dynamic relaxation. So we are using here a conventional parametric model to generate uh, several samples that could be fed into the AI model for training. So here you see how three different categories of structures that these shells with two, three, and four openings were generated. And the 3D models were then converted into to, to the depth maps in order to train the, 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 the AI model. So here's a, a representation of um, the training process. I have implemented a variation of encoder, which performs basically two tasks. We have an encoder which extracts design variables from a set of design precedents. It builds internal represent, representations and um, which are then used to construct a design space, which is um, in variation of the encoder called Latin space. Then it learns to generate a parametric model in order to transform this abstract representation back into its original form, that is a 3D uh, shell. So these are this animation shows also the ability of the model to cluster the three different categories of structures as training proceeds. And this is the result of uh, being able to extract relevant information describing the, uh, this uh, geometric feature, which is extremely interesting because the model had no previous knowledge about about any symbolical um, representation. Here you see how the trained model can be used. And uh, these interpolations are generated in the Latin space. And uh, um, are, um, the output produced by the machine are hybrid designs that uh, are created by um, blending together the features characterizing individual topologies. So this also show that the, um, the variational encoder is able to generate a design space from precedents. The question now that we ended up with two different design spaces, the one that was constructed to generate the samples for the machine and the second that was built by the machine starting from such samples, what are the differences between the two? So does it really make sense to train a variational encoder on such a data set? To answer this question, these two design spaces were compared in an optimization application. So on the left, you see the objectives that were um, defined. We have a structural, um, structural analysis, then other two opening site and footprints overlapping were included to account for functional requirements. So on the right, you see the results of a multi-objective genetic algorithm, which was run starting from these three objectives, starting from two different uh, footprints. So we want to cover a given footprint, in this case, it's a triangle and uh, generate um, and generate shapes that uh, are able to, um, structures that are able to cover this uh, footprint. So on the top, you see the results from the human, um, human defined design space. You see that um, most of the, the results are predictable. They just reflect the recombination of variables that were predefined by the designer. On the bottom, you see some nice variation on the topology uh, described by three openings performed um, that were found in the AI generated design space. So this demonstrates a flexibility of the AI generated design space and its ability to, the possibility to retrieve solutions that are significantly different from those that could be found in the, the initial design space. Uh, we run a second test here, st uh, starting from a square footprint. Again, you can see on the top solutions retrieved from the human design design space. You see that they are mostly conservative. On the bottom, um, you see the emergence of new topologies that were found in the uh, biogenerated design space. For example, solution E is a shell with one opening. Solution D is a nice variation of a shell with two openings. So having tested the ability of uh, 
very short in order to learn design spaces, we wanted to um, move further. So we started with the data set of real designs. So we have here 40 uh, design precedents of shell and spatial structures. These were modeled and fed into a very short encoder to um, do exactly the same thing. So to construct the design space. And here you see interpolation this time between four designs that have been highlighted in here in these uh, red circles. And uh, we had to apply a very complex strategy for data augmentation in order to make it work with just 40 design samples. In this animation, you can also see how the dev map can be converted into a 3D point cloud and how this formal representation is uh, can better communicate with the, with the designers to just different design possibilities. What's most interesting about this, is in, um, this application is, however, the use of the model, uh, not by just sampling the design space, but to interpret new designs. So um, in the previous application, we have seen that uh, we can sample the design space. So basically the encoder, the space of the encoder representation and decode them back into a design solution. But what the, this model is able to do is um, to also interpret any new input, which doesn't necessarily represent a 2D that map. It can be just like the, the footprint of a, of a building. And it generates a design starting from that. It interprets this input. It generates a design that is consistent with the knowledge it has acquired during training. Um, so you, you, you see a representation of the, uh, the interpretation of these abstract forms. Uh, we can also perform interpretation multiple times in a recursive uh, fashion. So which means that we can ask the model to generate several uh, interpretation um, and thus do not solve this interpretation task in a deterministic way. We will have many more solutions uh, to analyze. So this slide shows several other um, examples. So here, starting from these um, inputs, we, have, we are generating different interpretations. This time visualize a 3D uh, point close in a render view. And we have 88 different um, interpretations. So I'm highlighting here just a few words. Um, uh, in, that are quite interesting, like the uh, development of this solution with the, the cantilever in here, on the second one with the wavy opening. Um, so after having tested the ability of the model to perform these things, uh, I then developed an AI CAD interface in order to facilitate the communication with this, uh, with this model. So um, the communication happens within uh, conventional CAD software, I use Rhinoceros. And uh, uh, then there is the exchange of information based on the um, design of some curves um, on the, the, so you, you see an animation, how the communication is performed. We can manipulate this curve and we have feedback from the machine in real time. I've used this strategy to also analyze the interpretation performed by the machine, starting from three uh, design precedents, um, the, which represent different architectural issues. So how to blend the uh, rectangle with a, with a circle, uh, how to solve the uh, corner problem, and also how to create, um, a canopy that is able to that can cover and merge two volumes together. So here are some of the results achieved. You can see that um, the interpretation we we have different interpretations here with different data formatting, starting from the same footprint, and on the right a selected design. Uh, you can see that somehow it's uh, very similar to the to the input design. So I mean to the original design. In other cases, it shows like nice uh, variations. So in this case, it didn't realize a, a single opening, but it plays some supports in between. But what's interesting is that when the span is larger, it increments the curvature as one would expect when uh, for, for a design of this kind, because you want to increase the curvature you know, to maximize the resistance. And here again, a nice uh, variation of the, the same uh, for the same architecture problem where we see again this feature and uh, um, the design resembles more like the Isler shells than the original uh, design. We also see that we have many other solutions to look at and uh, some nice variations in here where we don't have necessarily an opening on every edge. So I will just quickly introduce uh, playfulness as a second um, mechanism. So uh, playfulness uh, was implemented uh, with the idea that design is not necessarily uh, need um, design precedents uh, to, um, to learn about design. They can learn how to design by interacting with objects. And this was inspired by looking at kids when, when they engage with the wooden blocks. So they are able to create spatial configurations, even without being that interesting, even without being explicitly trained in, uh, in design. Um, on the right, you see how this can be implemented and modeled uh, 
with the reinforcement learning, uh, with the reinforcement learning. So we have the an environment that is simply the 3D space. Then we have uh, the agent, which is a neural network that looks, the, um, that observes the, uh, the environment, the state of the environment, and then decides what to do. So in this model, we see that the, um, the agent plays its block by observing a state specific state of the environment until it generates a 3D spatial configuration. And this 3D spatial configuration is then passed to a structural analysis tool in order to get a reward, which is a feedback on the structural feasibility. So I've just started exploring this in a benchmark. I've devised, um, I had to develop a building game or a drawing game, I would call it, when the agent in, is trained to draw a structure, a 2D frame structure, um, and is, in, is shown with different obstacles and the start position and position. The cursor can be moved in any single location. And when the structure is complete, it's sent to, um, to a FEM tool in order to provide uh, structural feedback. So you see the stages of the training process. The exploration, like in a conventional optimization process, is performed by providing the model with several boundary conditions, which are represented by several uh, obstacles. You can see that in the first stages, the model doesn't even um, reach the second super point, but eventually it does, and it enforces this strategy in order to consistently produce solutions that you can see on the right that are stable, not only complete, but also stable, so structurally feasible. And you see how um, the, uh, a trained agent with the reinforcement learning can be used in a design task. Of course, this is just preliminary, but it already uh, shows the way in which designers can interface with this, with this model. So on the left, you see the prediction performed from many new boundary condition. So this is substantially different from conventional optimization because in conventional optimization, we, you start with the boundary condition and then you let the algorithm run several iterations in order to achieve the, uh, the best performance in here. Since the algorithm learns a design strategy, you can start with any new boundary condition and instantly the model is able to generate a design solution that is feasible. And in this histogram, you also see how many times the structure is feasible, actually. So we have um, a nice distribution here. What's also interesting is the new form of interaction that is suggested by this model. So you can start by tracing, the human can start by tracing a path. And since the model again learns a design strategy, is it's able to interpret the, the path designed by the, um, drawn by the designer to complete, complete it. So what you see here in gray is designed by the uh, designer and is drawn by the designer while the purple one is completed by the uh, AI agent. So the question now is, uh, of course, this is just a benchmark and I will have to, I will explore like more complex applications. But the fact is uh, designers, it's true that designers can learn by trial and error. But uh, if we go back to the example of the kid uh, that engages with wooden blocks, you see that uh, I, I was saying that they are able to generate interesting configurations. The reason why they are able to do that is not by randomly placing blocks and by getting just a reward signal in terms of structural stability. Because if the, it was this was the case, they were just piling up up blocks in a vertical um, you know, to create like a column. But that's not what they do. In this picture in here, you see that they can uh, create patterns. Uh, they can use um, color patterns or, and also they can use symmetry. So the question is, uh, um, of course, they don't use um, knowledge acquired through a formal training, but they still use knowledge. And this knowledge is gathered from the observation of the natural world. So what you see on the right uh, is um, the educational method that was developed by the German pedagogue, uh, Fribble. And uh, Fribble acknowledged that kids observe nature and they reproduced it. And they devised this, um, it, the Fribble gift are um, this uh, set of blocks that are designed to make kids uh, engage in the exploration of spatial configuration while reproducing what they observe in nature. So we have three different categories of forms that can be reproduced. Those related to, uh, specifically to nature are the forms of beauty. So. Um, if kids do that, we should be able also to implement this uh, behavior in, uh, in playfulness. And we are moving now towards analogical reasoning because we are not using just information from the interaction with an environment, but we are trying to get some knowledge from nature in terms of visual patterns and to reduce such knowledge for the generation something new. So uh, here's just an, a quick like illustration of how this could be implemented in the benchmark that we have seen previously. So we can consider a data set uh, of fractals, which are patterns that can be found in nature and force the model to use such visual patterns when it attempts to generate uh, 
um, a frame structure. And that's the end of this presentation. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Neil, um, would you like, uh, Marisa Bell, would you like to have some comments? I can let Marisa Bell, you go first, if you want. I don't want to put you in spot. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, okay. I mean, <clears throat> So, Kevin, I you know I've heard you before at the Digital Futures, and I really like your uh, your 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 work uh, because you combine this kind of um, technical. Uh, I mean, you're really in charge of the technical side of things, but also you you um, you kind of uh, uh, you br you bring in some sort of philosophical viewpoints. And you remind me, I don't know if you know this guy Max Tegmark, uh, MIT, but he wrote a very I think a really interesting book about about um, about AI from a kind of human perspective. Um, so I really I really appreciate it. I just I mean I guess I I mean um, there was one diagram early on where it was and like maybe I'm seeing this in the light of Alicia's comments and things about a kind of feedback loop between the human and the machine. And um, I guess I would just I would just I mean I think this is really interesting for me as a kind of theorist to try and think about what what what, what all these things might mean and. I, I would just I would just suggest that maybe it's 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 a kind of like a it's not quite so simple as this kind of feedback loop itself. Um, I, I, I think that, um, in that and it goes to some extent into the kind of actor act, act network theory we discussed beforehand. But I think that in the end, I mean, the guy that I, I really like in terms of talking about these things is a guy called Andy Clark. I don't know if you know him, but he's a he's a. Mm -hmm. he, University of Sussex, a really smart guy. In fact, Charles did his PhD on some of his one of his books. But he, I mean, so he kind of like the way he takes this. And I'm, I'm, my apologies, this is a philosophical response to your work, but I think it's a good work. So you know, I'm, I'm, I want to respond in, in, to challenge you in some way. And, and um, so he, I mean, his debate about because some people are saying we're now in this kind of um, uh, we're now in the post-human world, you know, where the, these things are sort of taking over. But he said, no, 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 not at all. We are absolutely precisely located in the 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 human world and the the key to his idea about you know, cyborgs and things is it's precisely the kind of the way in which the human can adapt to these tools um and it, we remain very centered it's still us you know in charge in some ways um and we have to be careful of, of ascribing too much agency to 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 the other side um but I, yeah so i would maybe sort of caution you to, to kind of like keep the the balance in some ways but i mean so there was a lot of things that were coming out that i found enormously um provocative in, in, in how you're suggesting things but to my mind it's I think also we need to sort of see to tease out the differences between us and AI I mean I mentioned before I don't think we have the the the, the term learning and the term intelligence we've got to be very very careful about not just anthropomorphizing the things but I think what is interesting is this kind of the relationship where we can see it in Andy Clark's terms in terms of a, a kind of extended intelligence you know where it's it's kind of still the human still in charge but then there are certain things i think and it's not so equal it's not as though he, uh, robots are better uh, ai is better than humans it's just a question at what you know and we found out that in certain things like you know go for example we we can't even compete you know and so to my mind it's really kind of a question of finding out what it is that where we're better and, and what it is they're better at and try to find some kind of synergy where it's accepting the differences between them and, and exploiting them in some way but I, you know, I, I just want to say that I really, I really appreciate the kind of the um, the kind of philosophical uh, uh, kind of uh, twist that you give things, and, and I, I think it's great when when engineers um, are, are, um, are thinking in those terms, and I really respect it because you you know the tech, technology and and you you're kind of embarking on some new territory. So just that question about playfulness, for example, I don't know whether humans are that playful we have our limited biases right i mean as soon as you feed it through 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 ai you just get a range of different things we didn't even think about it and i think that's the point is really where ai can be complementary and really enhance uh you know enhance humans so you know i think it actually to my mind it's ai has this possibility of bringing out the humans to become more human but but you have to see it as a kind of complementary thing where it's it's not just one person the other it's a very very nuanced and subtle thing but i think you know that already right i mean uh, yeah. Anyway, thank I, you. I, I, to I totally agree with you, Neil, and I thank you for for the feedback. Uh, what I'm really interested in is these cognitive aspects on uh, your. That was uh, a very 
a strong component when uh, architects first started exploring artificial neural networks in the 90s. So they wanted to understand how designers design. So that was also the very first aim of using AI. You know, it was used in psychology as a model for human cognition. They wanted to understand, first of all. And then they, of course, they needed to monetize this research. So they started developing systems that could be used in uh, different professions. But for me, it's really um, a way to understand more about how designers learn, first of all. Um, and of course, there is this second side that I'm interested in, and the fact that uh, we have been using computers in a very passive way so far. So, and I, I would like to provide computers a little bit of autonomy. And this autonomy is not in uh, designing by themselves. They are not able to design because they don't have any motivation to design in the first place. So do, you cannot leave machines able to just learn design knowledge and then expect them to design the city of the future. They don't, they simply are not human. And I totally agree with you on that. Um, but um, at the same time, I think that giving them a little bit of autonomy in the learning those things from design, rather than providing them with uh, such knowledge in a formal way, which is like, for example, the strategy of formalizing the describing design variables, constructed design spaces. If, if this stage of the computational design workflow is performed by machine, we could end up with uh, a model that is able to suggest something that it's unexpected. It's unexpected because the way machi the machine learns is completely different from the human one. So I'm finding um, something good in these differences in human intelligence and artificial intelligence. It's like, you know, talking with someone with a different culture. So you can get something new because we have the day, you know, those people have different perspectives on the same thing. They learn in a different way. Because learning at the end is just a, a matter of categorizing experience in a different symbolic um, representation frameworks, right? So if you use a different language and we and machines use, use a different language, um, we are able to communicate on different uh, levels. But there is still need a form of communication that allows the exchange of information, right? And this form of communication in my application is mostly visual. So you communicate via, via images, basically. We don't need necessarily to understand what happens inside the model, so at the patterns level, to communicate with the machine. We can just look at images. Yeah, just to follow up with that, I don't want to take too much time, but, but I, you know, I completely agree. I, in fact, my whole approach is, and right now I'm writing about AI, is, is to say that, you know, uh, it's actually the AI can become a mirror in which we can begin to understand what 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 it is to be human in some ways. And one of the fundamental um, kind of things I, I began to realize as I was researching this book, and I wasn't looking at architects, obviously I was looking at, at AI researchers and, 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 and neuroscientists and so on, it's, it's actually, the, the weird thing is that the neuroscientists and, and, and the AI people are really looking at the same thing, you know, and you get these people who are, are kind of like, uh, that's Anil Seth who did a, a PhD in 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 AI who becomes a, a neuroscientist, or you get you get others. Uh, uh, I forget the names of them, who've done the opposite, done a, done a PhD in, in in neuroscience and become AI. And in the end, the, all that the, what they're looking for is not artificial intelligence. They're looking for intelligence. That the the quest for AI is the quest for intelligence itself, and that's incredibly interesting. And I you know I think you're onto something here, and I, I just would encourage you to keep that philosophical side of things alive because it's great when uh, when when you combine these two, so um, great. Um, so have a look at the, the discussion I put in the chat that well, in the, the the architecture philosophy thing because I was trying to look at some of those kind of questions and explain. I, I mean, not explain. I was trying to ask questions because we don't know anything. All we can do is ask questions, but it does it forces us to ask questions, and I think it's that's what is so provocative about this new new domain. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, Marisa Bell. Do you like to have some comments or questions? So, oh, Gabriel, thank you very much. I, I really have no question, uh, I mean, following uh, what Neil um, just said, but uh, one of the things that I found uh, kind of uh, struck me a little bit was, again, I appreciated the way you kind of established this uh, the series of uh, sort of the groups of sort of knowledge making uh, from the expertise to the playfulness to the analogical analogical reason. And that's where um, I had questions about the way that you were approaching analogy or the way that you were thinking about analogical uh, reasoning uh, in the context of what you are setting up uh, in the sense that it felt to me almost like uh, there's that crucial idea that you brought up or Neil brought up, which is this idea of that there has to be a difference. It can't be. So, so it, at a certain point, I thought 
that you, it seemed to me that it, uh, your analogical reasoning felt almost like a mimesis of, of a sort where you were just extrapolating from one domain and bringing it into another. Whereas it seems to me that analogy works in a slightly different way, which is to not simply imitate in a different sort of boundary condition or in establishing by establishing a different boundary condition, but that it's actually um, extrapolating a series of relationships which translated into another domain may actually elicit a completely different thing. Does that make sense what I just said? It makes a uh, lot of sense actually. Uh, that's how- so that was my um, only thing that I went like, eh, you know, I have to ask him this question. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the applications that I've um, I've shown that it is just like the very um, development stage, so I haven't explored yeah. it yet. Um, but uh, the idea is uh, to use um, yes, th there is this idea of imitation, which is only one way in which we can use analogical reasoning. There are several other ways. Uh, there are like analogies can be constructed at superficial level or at um, at the structural level by. Um, there are like a first predicate or second predicate relationships that we can uh, use. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a large literature in, uh, on analogical reasoning. Um, I understand your point. I mean, uh, of course, analogical reasoning for the science works much, at a more deeper level than this. Um, the fact is, uh, I'm just uh, really testing some ideas. So um, for my first application would be still in the context of playfulness, but expanded to analogical reasoning. So I want, I want to try to see if we can force the model to use some information from a different domain when solving a different task. Um, and of course, this information is only visual. And analogies in uh, like using nature as a source of inspiration is much more interesting because, for example, engineers uh, use like... Um, functional analogies, right? And uh, that's what allows them to generate like innovative solutions. In order to perform something like that, we will need a very complex representation of design, uh, which involves not just like 3D models, but also how things work. Uh, how many components are they made of? Um, this is uh, extremely complex. But... Transform, yes. Yeah. I, I guess that, that was my question. And I'm almost, I almost want to say, or at least that's just my sort of the kind of approach to this and, and thinking about it. Uh, and, and of course, um, that in, in many respects, playfulness is an actual expanded an, uh, analogy. It, it is analogical in many ways. Uh, uh, and so I would, I understand the need to create these kind of very sort of delimited categories for this point in time when you're framing your, 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 your research. But I would, I would, I would, I would, um, suggest <laughs> that maybe playfulness is another form of an, uh, 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 an uh, analogical uh, reasoning that it we still don't understand is. fully. And that that Go ahead, sorry. No, 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 so sorry, sorry if I interrupt you. I totally agree with you. The fact that for me to separate them is just to analyze small pieces together. But yeah. I know that the scientists don't use just one uh, of these strategy at a time. It, they are all integrated. Yes. And of course, you can see that the analogical reasoning is uh, the integration with the playfulness is very strong in there. Uh, but we also use uh, like uh, knowledge uh, about design precedents when we engage in the playful exploration, right? We tend to imitate what you already we, we already know about design. Right. Uh, so this this design. this distinction doesn't exist in right. reality. It's just a, a, a way for me to um, analyze to break down the complexity mm -hmm. of uh, you know um, trying to understand how we can train uh, machines. But at the end, and that's what I uh, what it turned out the experiment in playfulness. So. <laughs> Playfulness implemented this way without any uh, form like of knowledge, even about other domains, not necessarily architecture, it simply uh, produces naive solutions. Right. Right. It's wonderful work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marisman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. Oh, well, uh, given the limited time, we have to move on, but there are some questions from YouTube. Maybe uh, Gustavo helped post them on the, on the chat. So maybe you could also take a look and maybe reply in, in, in text. Thank you, Gabriel. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so now let's move to the to the last presenter, Zheng Hao. Um, Zheng Hao, would you like? Okay, uh, thank you. So Zheng Hao is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, conducting research on machine learning and generative design. And his, his research also covers uh, different areas like digital fabrication, AR, MR technology, 
Um, Zheng Hao received his master's degree from UC Berkeley and bachelor's degree from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, Zheng Hao also has many teaching and research experience at different institutions like Tsinghua University, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, and of course, Digital Futures. Uh, I just want to highlight that Zheng Hao has been a very good friend and a really a generous supporter to Digital Futures for many years. So let's welcome Zheng Hao. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, my, pre my presentation today actually involves in my uh, PhD proposal. So uh, in University of, of Pennsylvania. So the title is actually uh, Joint Machine and Topology Building Machine Learning Slogan Model for Design. So it's quite uh, different than my previous research about some general design case in machine learning. So, so uh, this involves uh, more about the, top, the, top, the topology and geometry in structural, in structural design. So uh, actually my presentation includes five, uh, five parts. One is the, uh, so it starts from the historical instruction to the final case, case study. So we have two case study about the structural design of how we use topology as the material for machine learning. So historically speaking, we start from which ways. So in, so in which way uh, he actually defines a linear function to, to measure the elements in architecture, for example, the highs and the on the, on the, for example, the height and the radius of a column. Then, uh, in in Renaissance, already uh, actually inherits his uh, his theory and uh, developing different types of uh, linear functions to define the measurements in architecture. Then recently, uh, the the Corbusier also uh, developed his uh, his modular for the linear system to uh, to uh, involve in this uh, kind of uh, architectural design design process, but we can actually conclude uh, the the history of this architectural de uh, design as a discrete process in which we have state and uh, rules. So that's why we have uh, a, de a development in the current uh, parametric design uh, thinking uh, path that that we can uh, define everything into the two two. Uh, Two stages. One is the uh, one is the start uh, stage, and the other is the end end stage. So we have seen many uh, per, many parametric design case that that they can actually uh, define a, a, a starting uh, stage. Then they use different rules to uh, to make this state to make this stage run by itself, and then we get a final stage. So uh, if a, if a stage is is also satisfied with the designer, then then we can use use this final design stage as our design. So this is the tra tra traditional design thinking of the parametric or, or our digital design theory. But actually, machine learning gives gives a different opportunity that we can regard the design as a uh, as a case that we uh, use data to train the machine to to replace the human designer to complete this 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 design task. So previously, in the uh, in the algorithmic design, we actually have this input data. Then we can de define our function. Then the computer can, can, can help help us to uh, generate the output data. But in the machine learning, we can generate all or we can connect the, the input and the output data, then we can train the machine model, then we ask the machine model to generate the design case uh, from, uh, from the perspective of our data. Uh, previous study uh, includes some uh, geometric machine, machine learning. So in previous, uh, in the previous study by other researchers, they actually uh, regard the architecture uh, geometry as the main uh, learning material. So, so we so we we have seen many uh, many application papers that they use, uh, for example, floor plans or the facade or some or some street views as a, as a training material to train the machine to generate the floor plan or some design case. Um, the other the other application is the evaluative uh, machine uh, machine model in which the researchers actually connect. Uh, uh, connect geometries and their properties. For example, their features. Then they train the machine learning model to see whether uh, whether the machine can learn the mapping between the geometry to the features. So that that would be a predictive uh, and the evaluative model to predict some some properties. For example, the structural properties of the uh, of what is that. Then uh, the topology is actually another uh, aspect of the of the of, of the design. For example, they actually uh, re uh, represents the relationship between uh, each each design elements. So rather than geometry, they might not have a very uh, 
where a clear understanding of the visual representation, but they actually represent uh, another aspect of the design case from the relationship between each design element. So previously, uh, uh, some researchers in architecture design field also uh, regard the topology as um, a represent represent representation of the architecture space. For example, they regard the uh, the uh, the the relationship graph of uh, of a four four plan in replacement of the uh, of the uh, real architecture draw, uh, drawing and, and they also use some kind of relationship map for uh, for human to 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 represent the usage of 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 uh, office. Uh, so in my uh, dissertation, I, I I actually try to uh, try to say that whether uh, so whether we can use the topology as a as a different representation of the geometry, then we train the machine learning model to learn this topology rather than the geometry to see whether the machine model can learn this intrinsic logic behind the geometry as a topology. So we have actually two uh, case studies about the structural design. So actually, the structure is uh, is a very nice case that we can transform its topology and geometry very easy by some soft, soft by some software. So in trust one, we care about uh, a structure de the structural design of the shell like structure. So it actually uh, involves in a, 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 a method called graphic statics. So in graphic aesthetics, rather uh, than defining the structure itself, we can define its topology as the force diagram as uh, as figure D. So in force diag uh, so in force diagram, we can uh, use some, uh, for example, rules to gen to generate this kind of closed polyhedron. Then this post then this closed polyhedron can be transformed into the form of uh, figure E here. But the main problem is that we can have a, have a lot of, for example, different subdivision of this force diagram. Then, then we can get a lot of a, a series of corresponding form diagram here on the right. So the problem is that uh, uh, we can evaluate uh, how a structure performs itself by some uh, criteria. For example, the structure, for example, the structure uh, performance or the constructability to represent whether a structure here is is suitable or is better for for construction or for real real pro real project. Uh, then we can use a traditional evaluation process that we can go through all the possibility or or we can run, uh, for example, a, a genetic algorithm to find what's the best uh, performance uh, structure here. But the problem is that actually uh, from the process from, uh, from the topology to the geometry and also the, the process to evaluate whether this, uh, to evaluate the performance of this structure actually takes a lot of time. So uh, it's, al it's almost uh, uh, technically impossible to find the best solutions if, if the evaluation process takes Take so much time here, so that's why we can involve in the machine learning of the topology rather than the geometry. So we use the design rules on the on a top, on a topological graph as the training material. Then we then we actually run the uh, the, the time consuming process to to generate just a, a, just a number of cases. Then we can use the machine learning to learn the mapping between the topo the topology to the final perform. Uh, to the final performative uh, matrix. So by by doing by doing that with the trend model, we can then uh, input the new uh, topology here to ask the, the machine to find what's the best uh, perform, per, performative models here. So by doing so, we can actually uh, so we can actually uh, decrease the time to a very uh, to a acceptable numbers uh, to a acceptable hours that we can apply this to the engineering solving problem. Uh, so in the end, uh, with the trend model, we can then uh, ask the, the machine model to filter out the, the result we want. For example, they can have different different uh, evaluative metrics. And finally, we can so we can also uh, all, we can also have this kind of graph showing that the, uh, the forms that the, the machine learning finds. For example, uh, in the uh, in the uh, bottom right of this of this. Of the image, it actually finds the best performance model, which which does not have a very uh, very large buckling force. Uh, force uh, all the faces are constructible with uh, with a very equally number of errors. Uh, also, based on that, we also uh, uh, developed a tool that the designer can freely define their their design prototype. Then by uh, then by gradually uh, training the model, we can actually uh, optimize. 
the uh, also generate the final design case here in in Figure Ten. So this is the final design case. If we applied our tool in in, in generating a very complex uh, uh, structure case, so in this case we actually uh, so again we actually train the machine machine model by the topology rather than the geometry. So the training process is very fast with an ALM frame, uh, frame, framework. So it actually uh, skip or 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 escape the uh, traditional uh, ge uh, generative process of the geometry. So uh, to 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 make the topo to make the topological uh, evaluation faster than the geometric evaluation. So in the second uh, trust, we actually uh, learn the topo topology from the nature uh, nature structure as a as a, as a dragon five wing. Uh, in the Jacob Five Wing, we also have uh, have, a, have a structure, for example, a form and a force diagram. So this picture actually shows the form and force diagram of uh, of the Jacob Five Wings. On the Jacob Five Wings, uh, by uh, applying graphic static method, we can get the, the topological uh, topological information from the geometry of the Jacob Five Wings. Then, then we can use that to regenerate the form the form diagram of the of, of the Jacob Five Wings. So so actually by by doing that, we can have a comparison of, of different drinking valving cases. And we see that actually they are quite quite similar. So we can so we successfully prove that we can use the force diagram as a as a representative for the form diagram of the drinking wings. So what's interesting is that uh, uh, rather than generating the, the Dragon Fire Wings pattern directly, we can use the force diagram instead of the form. So we can train the multiple machine, uh, machine models from uh, machine model one to four to, to gradually generate the structural form from the boundary. So the goal is that is uh, so the goal is that we want to train the machine model to generate the structural form from the boundary. So in the beginning, we actually train the three uh, machine models to ask the, the machine to generate the force diagram rather than the form uh, uh, itself. So we train the machine model one to get a force boundary from the form boundary. Then we great, uh, great, gradually uh, to uh, train the machine model to, gen uh, to generate the force diagram. Then by graphic aesthetics, we can also uh, transform the force diagram into, a, in, uh, uh, in, into the topology of this form diagram. Then we train, a, train, train another machine model for, for to actually predict the actual structural sequence or the, or the, or the actual structural length of this, of, of this topology. Then we, can, uh, then we can again ask the machine learning model from one to four uh, work, work together to generate the structural form from, uh, from its form boundary. So uh, technically speaking, uh, the the machine the first machine method we use is the uh, generative adversary network, which uh, learns from image to image. So we uh, generate the the Jacob Five Wings uh, uh, as as different stages of 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 these images. Then we can train this pixel uh, to pixel model to get the final uh, force diagram as images. Then uh, the second techniques is the air, is the AI based uh, uh, machine machine learning framework that. Then we can get the uh, vector-based information of this topology. Then we ask the machine learning to predict its its actual structural length by training an AI, an AI model. So finally, we can actually generate the different type of uh, 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 different drink five wings. So this image is uh, so that uh, uh, the the generation of the image in the in the testing set, which is not included in the training set. For example, uh, the uh, in the image A uh, in the in figure A, the form in the uh, uh, on the left is actually the real dragon five wing form, and the form on the right uh, on the right is actually the uh, our generated form. And also by uh, by some comparison of the statistics, uh, uh, statistics, we can see that actually they are quite quite similar. And also we have applied our rules in other species, for example the the gasopo wing, um, some water lily, uh, also some domestified wings. And we also uh, generate its force diagram rather than the form. Then we use the force diagram to generate the form. Um, we can see that actually the accuracy is, is very high here. So uh, actually uh, one thing to mention is that, uh, is that our training set actually includes very limited number number of cases. Uh, it, it only includes, for example, six piece of, uh, pieces of wings. On the, for the drink five wings, it only includes, for example, 25 pieces of, of, of wings. But actually, we can see from the result that the generated, the generated result is very similar to the real, real ones. 
Uh, the next step we are working, uh, we are currently working on is to apply this, this machine model in the real design problem that we can generate a kind of, a kind of design case. So for example, if we have a human defined boundary from the, from the beginning, then we, then we can use the machine model to generate its, its topology. It's topological for a uh, force diagram. Then we can use, uh, use this force diagram, um, uh, graphic, uh, graphic static method to prep or to generate this this form diagram based on its boundary. Uh, also, we can uh, also we can generate a, a three D force diagram. Then we can generate a three D form uh, uh, rather than this 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 two D form. So we are actually cur uh, currently working on this process to apply our rules or, or our machine model in a uh, use uh, in a usable tools for the designer to to uh, easily train their own data set and also to generate their own uh, their own structure. Uh, also, finally, we are going to uh, fabricate a case. Uh, then, then we will have some structural testing to say that whether our our generated structure is better than some commonly designed structure by, by human. If yes, then we can say that actually the, the, the machine model learns the, the advantages of the of the uh, natural structure for the for the geographic wings. Then we can uh, further conclude that we can use uh, use use this. A machine model as a design tool to help us to help uh, structure designer to generate better better structure. So this is the uh, end of my dissertation proposal. So it's still a proposal. So it, so so we are still working on some like design case on the on the fabrication case. Uh, okay. This end of my this end of my. Uh, okay, thank, thank you, Zhenghao. Uh, very interesting research uh, about applying AI technology to structural optimization. Um, I would like to invite Neil and Marissa Bell um, to put forward some comments. Marissa Bell, do you want to go first? Go ahead, Neil. I'm <laughs> trying <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I know how it's, it, it's obviously very, very impressive research. I, and um, I'm not a kind of topological thinker myself. So it was it was not my, didn't I didn't, wasn't able to lock in it to it too, too much. But I just have one question that is, in the early the third section you were showing, um, there were some examples that were not symmetrical. And I, I mean, that's great, right? I mean, I, uh, but or at least they appeared not to be symmetrical. And I, I, I had a experience of working with Christina Shea, who, who Produced this software called iFor I many years ago. It was about 2002 or something, and uh, it, it had this kind of stochastic, non-monotonic aspect, which allowed it to not come up with symmetrical things. And this is, what, I guess, what architects find interesting in, in many ways. But what was? Am I right in assuming that some of those those outcomes were not symmetrical? And and why why are they not symmetrical? I mean, I, I you know, I yeah um, yeah sorry yeah. So so I mean the first case of here, they are not symmetrical. Uh, for example, some forms they are not symmetrical, right? Yeah, is that right? Yeah, no. yeah, right. So in this figure, they are not uh, looking for some best case uh, uh, as some generated uh, as some uh, gen uh, generated algorithms. So they are actually finding solutions with with different evaluative methods. For example, the so so actually the form on the uh, bottom right it shows the best form, um, but the form in the uh, top left is the worst form. So by the by by training this 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 machine model, they can not only find the best form, but also the worst form, and also some forms between the best to the worst to see to see uh, whether it actually changes. So actually, uh, they are not symmetric. Yes, but the best form is symmetric actually, and the worst form looks very asymmetric. Thank you. The, the only other comment I had is you got the wrong translation of Alberti there. I'm sorry. That was a. You should have used my one. Okay, <laughs> I'm just joking. But <laughs> that was a, the one you were showing was it was a translation of an Italian translation of the Latin, whereas the one that uh, I produced, the Joseph Rickford, was a translation directly from the Latin. In your second slide, you you had a slide of Alberti. Oh, you mean uh, <laughs> you mean here? You there? Yeah. yeah. The the next one, Alberti. Next one. That was a trivia. Oh. Oh right. So I mean, I, yeah, that's the wrong one. <laughs> you don't know that has actually. I was going to be trans, going to be. I was invited to translate Vitruvius as well, but I didn't get around to it. I moved on to some other things. But um, yeah, anyway. But uh, yeah, wrong one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well. Okay. Well. Thank, thank you very much. I I wanted to follow up, but first of all, I, I find it fascinating and really beautiful research. Um, 
you know, somewhere at the very end, I was thinking, uh, well, Darwin is turning over in his grave right now. But um, one of the things that I really wanted to ask you is what do you, when you were referring to optimization, are you really speaking strictly about the structural optimization of the form? Yeah, right. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, in the first case, it's about the optimization, but they are based on the machining model rather than this traditional uh, computational process. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the next question I had had to do when you were showing the dragonfly wing. Yeah, the project with the, which I find really beautiful. I mean, it's this, there's this ephemerality to it that, that's just so attractive. But one of the things that I, I, I had a question about was when you are, um, and, and so when you are uh, developing your tool, are you also thinking about uh, external factors or is it simply the internal sort of structurization of uh, the parameters of this form? In other words, uh, a dragonfly wing, I would consider the force of the wind, the force of having to stay aloft. All of these things are actually conditions that also begin to inform what the form eventually becomes, correct? Yeah. So is that something that is implemented in your tool at this time? Yeah, right. So actually, we are revising this part because uh, be uh, so because we found that the, the reason we use this Force diagram is not uh, is not a very convincing. But the general speaking, the idea is that is that we regard the the drain fiber as a self stress system. Mm -hmm. So if we if we regard it as a two D flat uh, flat pattern, then 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 we can uh, and so 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 we can understand that as uh, as an internal compression only form plus a, an external bundle, uh, bonding ring. So they actually work together as a self stress system. So we can use that this force diagram for the internal, um, we can use another force di uh, diagram for the, for the external, then we combine them together to get a uh, real uh, topology for the entire ring. Yeah. I see. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. Really interesting work. Thank you for showing it. Thank you. <laughs> really nice. How can, can I ask you just one, one uh, provocative question? Mm -hmm. Can we use the term optimization? Uh, <laughs> Well, so I saw two. So I saw two case case studies. The last one is, is definitely non optimization. It's about the generation of the design case. And the first one is about the uh, form finding of a structural form. So they are not, uh, for example, op optimizing the form. They are just finding uh, the best form in uh, in a, a number of solutions, a possible solutions here. So I would call it is is kind of optimization, but it is it's optimizing the possibility rather than the solution itself. Yeah, I mean, I guess I I, I, I like asking engineers these questions. Actually, not that you're an engineer, but, but I guess the point is that we 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 technically we can't really call it optimization because we don't know what the optimum is, right? Right. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, engineers often say, well, yet yeah, nonetheless, the process of trying to find the optimum is maybe it's okay to use the term optimization. But um, anyway, I'm just. I'm just uh, teasing you there, but um, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. I think we are just on time, and in the end, I want to thank you all for being here, and thanks again for Chai Hua, uh, Alicia, Gabriel, and Jung Hao for your time and your presentation, and thanks Neil and Marcel Bell for giving really valuable and inspiring uh, comments. Um, so before we, we end the panel, Neil, would you like to have some final remarks? Well, yes. No, I mean, thank you, Chow, for chairing the session. Um, and thank you also for the team that's put this together. There are a lot of people there behind the scenes who, who are working very hard. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, I, I, I don't know, this is kind of like just reflecting on the, the four, four sessions we've had now. Um, and you know whether or not they have been useful or successful or, or, or whatever and i think that i mean well first of all it it, it seems to me that there that, that, that there is something to be gained from using this platform and bringing people together that you know really is useful just to go to the interface and the and the feedback and so on uh, and i think especially in the context of of, of phd students you know that uh, uh, you're working individually on your own and often Frankly, you're work, work, working with one supervisor. I know. I know that, uh, uh, um, that that's not always the case, and some people are fortunate enough to, uh, as as uh, Hua Chai, Chai Hua, but, but to to work with two institutions. But normally, you've got a very limited range of people, and, and 
you kind of have to buy into what they think in some ways. So, and that's, and so to have this debate is a good thing and a bad thing. You kind of like, you get exposed to different viewpoints, but you've got to keep to whatever your supervisor is saying. But I, I, I still think that actually that, that it's probably doctoral research of, uh, you know, more than anything else where we need this kind of platform because it is such an individual project and you know, and you're all in your isolation and, and i i really think that that it's a kind of it's a it's a it's psychologically it's a it's a it's a, it's a trauma right trying to get uh, doing a doctorate so to have that kind of support and feedback i think is is really kind of useful so um no i so i i i, I think that i th let's hope we can build upon this in some ways um you know i, I uh I mean, I've I just been seen through this genealogy of this different these different models because I started off a while back. We we were this morning. Well, it was last night for you in China with Areti and and, and Areti and I had been talking years ago about having a collaboration between Yak and and the university where I was just bringing other people in all together. We our view was that. Uh, just to repeat what I said this morning, was to say, you know, uh, Vicente Gaia said, well, you know, we make an airplane these days, we make it and you make the wings in, in Italy, you make the, the engine in, in, in the UK, you make the fuselage in Germany, and that's how we assemble things. So we've got to start thinking about education in those kind of ways. And, and then we moved on to, to I then set up this thing, the European Graduate School, which was kind of trying to do that, bringing in people like Aki Menges and, 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 and uh, John Fraser and so on to teach. And that was actually really kind of interesting, although it didn't, didn't last so long because of a very conservative dean. Then we went to Tongji to try and set that up, and that's happening in some ways. And now in, in FIU, we have this non-residential DDES, which is trying to sort of do the same, but largely online. And this is a kind of coming out of that because we had some debates on the DDES that were incredibly instructive, Just people coming together. and. You know what is what is the next step? I mean, the next step in some ways. Well, I don't know actually, but I, I think this is heading in the right direction. How can we really kind of consolidate this platform so it's it's not just a kind of once a year thing, but something where there's a continual feedback um, between everyone. Um, and, and I must say, I, I I think it's really good because not only do you use, you you get to know other ideas, you know which is great anyway but you really get to see the standard that is expected and if you're just embarking on a on a phd and no one really knows what they're doing and then you see bam what an amazing example and we've had some fantastic presentations today so um i just i, I don't know all i can say is i i think that the the the, the initiative of, of trying to consolidate things and, and open up and having a single platform to, to feed and share ideas has worked uh, um and i hope we can build upon it and and thank you for your presentations i mean we are We've had some really good presentations. I mean, this, today was fantastic, um, and I'm blown away by some of them. So, uh, so fantastic. Um, and thank you for the presented, and thank you for Chow, and thank you for the team behind it. Uh, I'm not sure, Marisabel would like to have some remarks. Uh, really, thank you for you being here for yes, with us three days. Well, as I mentioned in the uh, in the chat already, it's been a really it's been a true privilege to. Uh, you know, out of the blue, be able to sit in on these discussions and be able to participate and, uh, and, and hear such amazing presentations uh, to Philip, to Neil, uh, and to the rest of the uh, Digital Futures team. I thank you very much. Uh, this has been a true privilege, and I look forward to, to more. So thank, thank you, you Marisabel. That was your. I want to hear your research, actually. Um, but you, your comments have, have been really astute and sharp, and to the point, and very helpful. So, thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you, Marisabel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisabel. You're from Georgia Tech, right? I'm at Georgia Tech. Yes, I'm working with Lars Feibrook uh, at Georgia Tech. Great, great. Actually, uh, Tongji have a, a joint program, a PhD program with Georgia Tech in the past few years. Yeah. So uh, we're looking forward to probably uh, can keep this uh, collaboration in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Philip. It's uh, been a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I have a, a studio this morning. Uh, I missed um, some of your presentation, but I know Zheng Hao very well, and uh, his study is really interesting. And I'm co-advisor of his paper, and uh, he's doing, really doing some meaningful research. And his advisor, Mongsat, actually, uh, we invite him to make a lecture in the PhD consulting process several days later, two days later. So I'm looking forward for your advice to make uh, the lecture. Thank you so much to everyone. Well, Philip, just say, we, we just want everyone to know that we are, there are recordings of this and they're going to be uploaded. So, you know, it's incredibly useful. As a, I mean, I think actually for PhD students in the future, just yeah, to yeah, yeah. get a mm -hmm. head around what is expected, this is incredibly good documentation. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.